Tonight we are celebrating the life and the achievements of an industry icon, and that is Dr. Manny Villafana. And he, tru he truly has a resume that, uh, that needs to be read, so bear with me. Manny he is globally recognized as a living legend of medicine. It's an honor that was bestowed upon him by the World Society of Cardiothoracic Surgery in 2006. He's an award-winning USA master entrepreneur, a member of the Minnesota Business Hall of Fame. He's inducted in the Minnesota Science and Technology Hall of Fame and was recently honored by his hometown, the Bronx, New York, by having a street named after him, Dr. M Dr. Manny Villafana Street. Manny has invented medical devices that truly have saved and touched the lives of hundreds of millions of people. And that includes over 5 million heart valves and 10 million pacemaker implants. Manny's got seven IPOs under his belt. He's not done yet, though. We're going to hear more about that later this week. He's founder of St. Jude, acquired by Abbott, founder of CPI Guidance, acquired by Boston Scientific, founder of ATS Medical, acquired by Net Medtronic, just to name a few. I recently had the honor of spending time in Manny's hometown, and we got to check out the campuses of all these medical device companies that he helped to build. And uh, it was quite impressive. It's, it's, it's amazing to see these campuses and to hear the stories about where they started, where they went, and where they are today. It's absolutely incredible. But the thing that impressed me the most was that anywhere I went, there was somebody that would call out and they'd say simply, hey, Manny. And Manny is somebody that has no doubt made so many friends in his life, but he's also, I'm pretty sure, made a few happy investors along the way, too. He's not done yet. He's working on Medical 21. He's going to talk about that over the, the conference, but we'd like to spend some time here just sharing and, and, and sharing his life stories. And I also want to point out that the lovely lady sitting next to him, they celebrated 40 years being together. And that's, uh, that's an accomplishment there. Elizabeth, you're going to go straight to heaven for sure. All right. So with that, I'd like to have Manny come up and we're going to present him with the LSI 2022 Lifetime Achievement Award in Medical Devices. Beautiful dinner concludes this interview. Manny wants to sit on the right. <laughs> I'll yield the chair to the right. Before we get started, let me just say one thing. Is this on? Yeah, okay. That Living Legend of Medicine Award? I got that in Canada. <laughs> yeah. And uh, again, before anything else, this is fantastic. These, to see so many friends and for some reason think that, some people think I've done this alone, but let me just tell you, None of the things that we have accomplished are ever accomplished without first your family, without members of the staff that are usually the smartest people around. Sometimes I think they're crazy for joining me, but they're smart, okay? And also by the investors who have taken hard earned money and said, Manny, we're going to take a risk with you. We're going to let it ride. We're going to throw it against the wall and make sure that's, you know, that's seven or eleven, okay? But at the end of the day, also the bravery of a lot of doctors and patients who have trusted us to be able to implant and develop a product that hopefully will bring better patient care, better survival, and a better life. So first of all, 
Scott, Chris, and a lot of other people here, thank you for this, this moment. What? Talk to me. <laughs> I'm speechless, Manny. Talk louder. I can't hear you. I'm speechless, Manny. You're speechless. There you go. We accomplished one Imagine thing already. That. Okay. <laughs> Over 15 million lives. Yeah. Just pause and think about that. <clears throat> Sir, that is an incredible accomplishment, and we thank you for what you've done. You know, well, to you know, set we, out. Go ahead. You tell me when to stop. Tell me when to start. <laughs> to set out on an endeavor to create technologies that are on the cutting edge alone is a scary thing to do, I know, because I set out to do it. I've often watched doctors who deserve tremendous credit for all the time and effort and energy they put in get praise. I've seen researchers get the highest awards, but often the work of entrepreneurs like you who take that research and translate it and innovate it into a form that it makes it into our bodies, into our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our fathers. Well, it's quite an accomplishment, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I was uh, criticizing this young man, okay, uh, recently, about maybe five hours ago. When I said to him, in the first two days that I had been here, I, I arrived yesterday, and, and I attended several meetings today that Chris was having. And I said, I did not hear the word risk. Not once. My wife corrected me. No, it was said once, Manny. I said, okay, all right. Well, maybe it was said once, but it wasn't said enough. And I also said to Chris, I said, I understand that what are you trying to do? Your group is made up of people who want to take money uh, or work with the money that has been given to them to put into investments to create new opportunities and probably most of all, the investors have demanded from you, don't lose my money. No, and this is, this is true. Your, the families and the groups that have invested through Meraki and your, your team of people were given, gave you the challenge, here, here's money, go do good things, and as I learned in the meeting, do good things but make it now well. Do good, but to make the investment well. And that's hard because, on the other hand, the good investments often, often, 99.999% of the time, take risk to do. I remember the first time I talked about risk, I was at Harvard. There was a couple of people, you know, Boston, you know that area, right? That's up there, you know. I was invited to give a lecture on, on uh, entrepreneurship many, many years ago. And I, and I said to them, and it was my last slide on the presentation, and we, at the time we had little 35 millimeter slides and you push a button, chick chung you know, Kodak was around. And I said, this is the last slide. And remember that the greatest hazard in life is a person who does not take risk. Because if you don't take any risk, nothing is going to happen, and you're going to end up being nothing. Well, to my surprise, one of the young MBA students jumped out of it. He didn't get up. He jumped out of his chair, and he starts using four-letter words and saying, what the effing are you talking about? 
How do you dare say that? And I turned around to him and I said, you know, look at your students that are here. They all went, whoa, boy, are you in trouble, you know. Okay, and I said, listen to the fellow students as well. By the way, that's Professor Tom Raymond at the door, the professor who invited me to come up here. And he's the guy that can give you an A, a B, C, D, or probably an F. Okay? But yet you got up very forcefully, got up and chose what to say. You wanted to say, Manny, you're full of, you know, whatever. Okay? You took risk. And that's the risk I'm telling you. In life, you constantly have to take risks to get the job done and be creative. And if you want to say, no, it's not right, say it. No, it's not right. So what I'm trying to say to many of you who are working with money to help the other half of the audience, the young entrepreneurs that are here, including me, okay? All right? That please take risk with the money. Tell your investors, we're going to take a little bit of risk here. And... Uh, and sometimes you'll see a little document that we will pass around that will say eventually you may lose your investment. But if you can't get investors who say who can understand that they may lose their investment, we're not going to try to lose it, but we, you may, innovation is going to be struggling. Yes, sir, what else? Manny, <laughs> have, have you ever heard of a an astronaut named Chris Hadfield. Chris? I believe he's a Canadian. All right. Okay. I think he's more flights into space than just about anybody. I had a pleasure seeing him speak. And he said the most eloquent words on risk. He said, and this is a person who's been in space, I believe, more than just about anybody on Earth, if not anybody on Earth. And what he said was this. I wouldn't walk a tightrope Think about that. I wouldn't walk a tightrope. And then he said, because it's not worth the risk. But some risks are worth taking. Very you know, good. You, you grew up, Manny, in the Bronx, right? South Bronx, yes. South Bronx. So yeah. you're a Yankees fan. Yeah, near the Yankee Stadium. <laughs> a little south of the Yankee Stadium. Yeah. And, uh, oh. What was it like taking the risks of a young man in the Bronx, growing up in the Bronx, to start companies and, and endeavor on the adventure that's been your life to this point? <clears throat> One of my very, very early comments about becoming a, an entrepreneur is uh, trying to keep the bill collector away from the door, okay? In the South Bronx, I grew up of a Puerto Rican family. My mother and father were born in Puerto Rico. I was born in, in, in New York. And unfortunately, my father had no education. Didn't, he would sign with an X, and I would try to grab his hand to teach him how to sign his name. My mother had a third grade education in Spanish, so that didn't help too much. My brothers, uh, I was the youngest of the youngest of the youngest of the youngest, so my brothers were all gone by the time I was 10, 10 years old. My father died when I was 10 years old. So it was just mom and I in the South Bronx, okay? We had gangs. We had a lot of trouble. They did a story about my street. My street was East 139th Street, and on the front page of the New York Times, they did a story, and the name of the story was Life at the Bottom. They indicated that the area where I was born was the poorest congressional district of the United States at everything, you know, drugs and crime and prostitution, and et cetera, et cetera. A lot of different things that were going bad. Fortunately, there was a young man, a friend of mine, a guy named Patrick Walsh, who lived at 595. I lived at 598, so across the street, and he introduced me to a boys' club. Boys Club was Kips Bay Boys Club. Fortunately, I was able to go there, and I went to the club practically every day. Stayed off the street. 
The street was gangs. I can tell you, if you ever had a long, long time to talk about it, I can tell you about threats to my life from the gangs. But anyway, I went to the boys' club, and I grew up in a boys' club, and they gave me the chance. I learned. They gave me my first job, and I always had to ask. I need, a, I need that job. I need this job because I didn't have any money. So the first criteria of being an entrepreneur is often helped by the fact keeping away from the bill collector, okay? Um, I just had opportunities that were given to me. I had to be self-taught, um, learned a lot by just studying and reading and, and doing things. Um, one day, the chance came up when I was living in South America for a, com a little company called Medtronic, which by the time I joined Medtronic, started working with Medtronic, their sales were total for one year, a million dollars. That's when sales were, their total sales was less than a million dollars per year. So it was very early on, very early on, okay? But their pacemakers were the best at the time, of course, they had the best pacemaker at the time, but it only lasted 12 to 18 months. They were the size of a hockey puck, and we had to do something. I, I came back after working in Latin America. I was working in Argentina and Chile and in and, and various parts of Latin America. They would all fail. And so when I came back, I said, guys, you got to make a better pacemaker. I uh, started working with a guy that was working on a new power source, and, and I went to Medtronic. I said, why don't we make a pacemaker doing this and this and this, a lithium power source, hermetically sealing, a, a variety of different electronics, things that we, we had to do. He said, it can't be done, Manny. Forget about it. So I went and started to do that. I approached it, tried to raise some money, mortgage my house, tried to sell a couple of kids. Nobody wanted to buy my kids. And... Um, and got going and took the risk, okay? Now, believe it or not, I was telling it uh, at the meeting uh, earlier today that on, during the very, very first long life pacemaker, lithium powered pacemaker, which all pacemakers are made out of lithium powered now, okay? It was done in a VA hospital, Max. Matt, do you hear that? VA hospital, okay? And uh, the, I, I said that I, I, was, I was sure that the surgeon had previously pitched for the Milwaukee Braves or something because he took the pacemaker and he actually cocked his arm and was ready to throw it against the wall because it didn't fit. And I said, well, hold on a second. Let's walk through this. And we finally figured out what the problem was and we got it and implanted. And, and that was the beginning of the first pacemakers. Um, and the rest is history. Um, we were able to get it going. At one point before I left CPI, we were already about 42, 46 percent of the of the pacemaker market. Not too bad for a little kid from the Bronx. Okay, not too bad. Not bad at all. And then, so you had that minor accomplishment, and then yeah. you went off to start another company. Oh yeah, that was that was even even funnier, because um, a doctor, two doctors approached me, Doctor Parsonet out of New Jersey and Doctor um, Nikoloff in um, in the Twin Cities, both surgeons, heart surgeons. They said, "Manny, now that you've done the pacemaker, we really need heart valves." Now at the time, when when they approached me. We were at uh, CPI, we were growing so fast that we were open 24 hours a day, you know, seven days a week, three shifts. We never turned off the lights in the building. We were building buildings as fast as we could to try to, to increase our capacity. So, so Dr. Nikoloff said, well, man, you should do this and this. And I said, how do you want me to do this? I said, oh, within CPI. Uh, well, okay, I'll talk to the guys. So I talked to the guys, and I said, hey, guys, Nick wants us to do a heart valve. And one of the guys said, what are you talking about, Manny? We don't even have enough time to go to the bathroom. 
okay? He said some other word, but I won't say that, okay? We don't have enough time to go to the bathroom. So I said, look, I've done my thing here. I've, you know, helped create this thing and, and innovation and variety. I don't get my, my jollies watching the company go from 500 employees to, to 1,000 to 5,000, know, like, like a lot of different CEOs. I've done my thing. I want to pursue this. So I said, I'm going to take one of the empty buildings that we're starting to empty out as we're building more and more buildings. And I said, can I do that, guys? And he said, Mandy, you can do anything you want. Talk to the landlord. And of course, the landlord was making so much money investing in, in CPI that when I said I want to do another company, St. Jude, of course, he said, anything you want, Manny. So we ended up building St. Jude. We developed a, a hard valve, the, the St. Jude hard valve. Uh, totally a, a concept that was so wild, so unusual. Um, making a valve that was literally made out of glass. It was pyrolytic carbon, which is a compressed version of glass, that if you hit it the wrong way, it would break. Okay, and then of course, every, every other valve was being made out of metal and rubber and plastics and to make it as strong as possible. And I was coming along with, if you hit it the wrong way, bing, into a million pieces. And I, re I still remember a couple of years later, there was an article in the uh, in one of the journals, Thoracic Journal, something like that. And the name of the article was "Open quotation marks." It will never work! Exclamation point! Close quotation marks! Dash the Saint Jude valve. And yet, it went on to be the most commonly used prosthesis in the world. What? What? Manny? What? 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 <laughs> Go ahead. It ain't gonna work. It ain't gonna work. <laughs> How many times have you heard? That? Oh, all the time. You know, you know. There's a key thing, to, and and I believe this, and not a lot of people agree with me, but you know, is that it's it's got to be something challenging, and it's got to be. It can't work, man. You can't do it. Forget about it. My my present company is called Medical Twenty One. It was a. I wanted to name it Medical One Eighty. But not enough people knew what the 180 meant. If you're on the engineering side of things, guys, ladies, it's 180 means you want to go the opposite direction. And that's what I do. Everybody was going this direction. Well, I'm not going to go that direction because everybody's failed. Now, the project that we have at Medical 21 has been tried for the last 45, 50 years. And everyone, I shouldn't say everyone, but Many, many, many companies have tried to do it. The Medtronics of the world, the St. Jude's of the world, the Boston's of the world, the Mayo Clinics of the world, Texas Hearts, and all these kinds of different things. And no one has ever been able to develop an artificial artery for bypass surgery. And that's what we're trying to do. And we've, and we've reached the point, we're now ready to go into humans. We're doing all the paperwork to try to get into the FDA and you know things like that. Thank you. We're not there yet, guys, but we're trying. Okay. Um, and and the thing is that we went a different direction. And uh, everybody was trying to make a, a a graph that was strong and this and that. And I came along. And I said, guys, we're going to make it very, 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 very weak. Strong. The opposite direction is weak. And we made something very, very weak. Because I wanted to, for a variety of reasons, I, it, this is not the place to discuss the technology, but for a variety of reasons, I wanted to make it totally weak, 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 so that when the graft was implanted, the body's own nutrients could get into the graft and grow within the graft a brand new artery. So that each individual had their own unique artery created by their own endothelial cells. And we're doing that, and we have done that. Uh, with me on this trip is uh, Dr. David Joyce, uh, previously from the Mayo Clinic, who is now with the Wisconsin Medical Center. And he came up, uh, he and his dad, who was also the chief of cardiac surgery at the Mayo Clinic, came up and they went to the lab. And, um, and they wanted to implant it. 
and they did an implant, and unfortunately, during the surgery, uh, we wanted to connect it to a certain vessel called the LAD, and, and after the whole surgery was done, David says to me, I, I said, Manny, I'm, I'm sorry, but you know, when we got there, the LAD was too far into the heart. We couldn't reach it, so we couldn't connect it to the LAD. We, we found a little vessel, about a 1.7 millimeter vessel, which is so small, we would never touch it in the human. It's too small. So, but we had nothing to do, so we connected. It's going to last maybe 24 to 48 hours. Okay, you had to do it, you had to do it. So, so about 45 days later, we took an image of that, and it was still working. So I called up David. I said, David, I don't want to call you a liar. <laughs> but it did not last 24 hours. It's still going at 45 days, and now it's over 180 days, which, as I said, or maybe I didn't say this, but once you reach 90 days with an animal, it, you should pretty well be able to go into humans. So we're beyond that 90 days, and so we're very encouraged that we're going to be going into humans. That's right. the latest challenge because it's the biggest challenge. And I, I don't want you to miss a critical point. I, don't, I didn't hear you say it. What? When, when you succeed with this impossible mission, right, what does it mean for the patient, not just that they have a graph, but what, what are you preventing? Oh, right. well, them we're from inventing. If, uh, have any of you have ever had a family member or even yourself or a friend who has had bypass surgery? I'm sure virtually everyone here, right? All right, bypass surgery, chest pains, it hurts. Ah, Charlie, you know, when Chris went in, they said, Chris, what the hell are you doing? You're eating all of these damn hamburgers and, you know, and you're still smoking and you're hanging out and rebel rousing and you've got all, you're drinking like a fish, you know, the whole thing. I've been spending time in Canada. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, right, right. And so, so your, your heart is starting to develop clots in your, in your you know, your vessels and, and that's why you're having the chest pain. So I'm sorry to tell you, I, you know, we tried doing, putting some stents in you a couple of years ago, and that didn't work anymore. So now you're going to have bypass surgery. Now, when you have bypass surgery, okay, and pay attention, women, they take vessels out of your legs. Those beautiful legs, I'm sorry, we're going to have to take vessels out of your legs out of legs, both legs, and 23% of the patients were also going to take vessels out of your arms. And in 95% of the cases, we're going to take the internal mammary artery off of your breasts, both men and women, off of your breasts and put it on, on the heart. I'm trying to eliminate all of that. All of that. Okay? So we have developed a, an artificial artery uh, in which it is our goal that that artery eventually disappears and is replaced by your own living cells. But one advantage that we have over any other attempt is that the remaining, the remaining structure is actually stronger. Remember we started weaker? It's actually stronger than any vessel in your body. Because we, in the meantime, we have put around it a, a nitinal source, a nitinal scaffold to give it all the strength in the world. Now, that's enough technology. Ask me about anything else, but no more technology. Okay. Well, I know it's chilly out. And people yeah. are getting hungry. Yeah. So maybe we'll wrap up with this. If you were to give, no, before this, I want to make a point because you talked about risk. And I've been hearing about risk all day long. I've also been hearing about helping people and saving lives. How do what? Helping people and saving lives. And the balance between the two. Now, you've started seven companies now? That's correct. And had how That's many number exits? Eight. Number eight. This is number eight? Yeah. And you've had some successes and some failures along sure. the way. You shared some that you shut down even, right? Yeah, right. But let's just take one example. St. Jude. Right. It sold for $30 billion? It sold for $30 billion, yes. Now, we talk about numbers, and they're hard to conceptualize. So my team 
which is pretty good at math, did a little math. If, if you took dollar bills, and since we mentioned uh, interstellar uh, planetary travel and the moon a couple of times, if you took the dollar bills and you line them up end to end, $30 billion would go from here around the back side of the moon, back here, again and again and again, how many times? From Columbia University, 15 times. Wow. Return to investors, and that's one of your efforts. Okay, may I help you in, in making that picture more clear? <laughs> if you gave me, when I started at St. Jude, the minimum investment at St. Jude was $16,500. Today, that investment, assuming that you went to sleep and you put it under your bed and you didn't touch it, probably worth between 90 and $95 million today. Are some risks worth the reward? Huh? Are some risks worth the reward? Yeah, the risk and reward ratio is pretty good there. And, <laughs> and now, Manny, one of the greatest experiences I've had in my life was being asked to speak at the American Cancer Society at a fundraising event. And it happened to be a week after the Oris Health robot was approved for doing biopsies of lung cancer. I had absolutely no idea that the approval would happen in conjunction with the speech. I ran out and I said, how am I gonna explain how this robot works? And I bought a bunch of hydrangeas Turned them upside down, I tied them together, demonstrated what the lungs looked like. I didn't think much about who was in the audience. I thought they were mostly charitable contributors to the American Cancer Society. And I told a story of how we could reach any point in the lung with this little robot to do a biopsy that would otherwise be seriously invasive, painful, and require a large portion of the lung to be taken out. What I didn't know was when I went to sit down, after explaining this had been approved, a large portion, perhaps half of the audience, got up as I went back to my seat and lined up to ask how they could help. And each one that spoke with me was a cancer patient. They didn't say, will it work for me? Will it save my life? They said, how can I make sure that the experience that I'm having isn't as bad for the next person. And regardless of the money that was involved for the investors or that was put to work, what I will never forget is what it was to put my head on the pillow that evening and know that the technology that so many people toiled for so many years to bring to reality actually was helping people. Sure. Now, we haven't touched as nearly as many lives as you have. I only hope that in my career, I can touch a fraction of the lives oh. that you've had in such a positive way. Yeah. Well, you know, again, thankful to God and like I said, our family and our team of people and, and our investors and a lot, a lot of people coming together to create something good. And we're doing that for technology. And there is the medical device industry. And of course, I always tease you about Boston and Minnesota, but we won't go there because I hate to see him cry. You know, uh, we do a lot of things in Minnesota and we do develop a lot of medical technology and we're still doing it. And uh, by the way, the numbers, when we talk about Medical 21, yeah, I'll put it in this perspective and then it'll be the last, last comment. When we started St. Jude, the world market was 65,000 valves of all types, mechanical, tissue valves, a variety of different valves, 65,000 per year worldwide. We estimate that for Medical 21, the world market will be there's approximately 800,000 to a million patients, but the average patient 
will need between three and four graphs. So therefore, the market is between two and a half and three and a half million graphs per year. 65,000 versus two and a half to three and a half million. We're going to help a lot of people. Well, thank you. I know you're going to do it, Manny. You know, Scott, I'm going to encourage you to change this from Lifetime Achievement Award because this is clearly not all the achievements that Manny's going to have in his lifetime. We wish you the very best of success in this next endeavor. So here's to the inspiration that you've given to everybody tonight who's going to go on a path that you've well traveled. Okay. And here's to the dreamers, to the doers of the impossible. And Manny, here's to you for all you've accomplished. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you.